excited to be here today at Westrack's first webinar and to talk about one of my favourite topics, efficiency and the application of technology, how we can make our operations safer, more reliable for our customers. We see a really major changing landscape over, over the last few years, uh, really affecting predominantly the mining industry and the drive towards autonomy and more, more simplistic operations. But it's exciting today to talk about how that affects uh, the construction business and the application of technologies and services within, within that sphere. Mm -hmm. So uh, with me today I have uh, Alistair McPherson from our technology group. I have Dane, uh, one of the directors of Core Group uh, from Caratha. And I have Chelsea Gray that heads up our client solutions team at Westrack. So uh, looking forward to the uh, conversation and, uh, and where it takes us today. If we look at the technology itself, um, maybe we can start with Alistair giving us an overview of what the last few years have done um, from a mining perspective and how, how we've seen a change in what the mining business was 10 yep. years ago to how it is today. And really, I guess, how you see that translating a little into the construction sphere today. Yeah, sure. So I guess the, the headline thing that we've seen is, is automation and, and uh, automated haulage. Um, but really, it's probably the journey that got there that, that is then relevant to what that means, for, I think, for the construction sector and where that will go. So there's been a number of technologies, I guess, that have come together to enable automation. So um, connectivity, computing power, um, and I guess the ability to um, capture a lot of data. Um, the sensor technologies come a long way. They all combine, I guess digitisation is probably the, the buzzword around that, but they all combine to allow us to, to automate. Um, and then we've, been, uh, we've seen that automation come into haulage and, and have significant impact on safety and, and productivity. A lot of the building blocks of that technology though um, actually have been around much longer. So if you, if you think satellite technology and, and uh, GPS systems in particular, they've been in survey, uh, they've been in the ag, for a long time, that sort of precision agriculture has actually been around um, for a long time. Going forward, I think what happens is then those technologies actually get disaggregated again and, and flow back down into some of that smaller equipment and, and the concepts get applied but at a different level. So in, in mining, it's it's automating the full machine. I think in construction, what we'll see is, is semi-automation or automation of certain functions and machine interactions where we can start to particularly use that data and, and the connectivity um, to have machines almost working together. Fantastic. Oh, you hit on a number of things there and then maybe there's a question for Dane in that. Uh, and, and Chelsea, um, connectivity is, is interesting. Um, you know, certainly a buzzword as we talk about how do we stay connected in real time or close to real time to our operations. Uh, and I know some examples, Dane, in your business of connectivity, I guess, affecting the maintenance strategy and the ability for for us as a dealer to better support your business. Maybe if you can talk through yes. how you see that as a benefit. So I suppose living in Caratha, up, up in the northwest corner of WA, um, what people post don't understand is that you drive 50 kilometres inland, you're in a pretty remote, hot, dark place mm. sometimes. Mm. So that connectivity for us and maintenance is pretty crucial. As you're going inland for these hot areas, that, that machines are in a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. And just having that service schedule can be so vital and so important to get the efficiencies increasing, but just get the jobs done. We're not Perth, we don't have a mechanic on every corner, and when we are three, 400 k's inland and machine breaks down, we need help. So be able to foresee that before it actually happens is a major, major bonus for us. And hence why we do partner with West Track on that, on that behalf, because many a competitor might call up, but without that backup service, or everything breaks down is probably what I'm trying to get at. Everything breaks down, whether you like it or not, and you need the backup service, which West Track certainly provide for us. Yeah, and just, I guess, going a little bit more into that, Dane, I know a recent example you were telling me about of, of you having a notification come up on your phone <laughs> of a machine with an issue. You shared that with a branch. They're seeing the same data in real time and are able to go and repair the machine with the right parts. Is, is that the story yeah, or it actually, some context it was, to that? There's two, two stories. One was a, a grader on a Friday afternoon. I, it showed up a code. I just actually got home and opened up a beer, which is very rare for me. And the code actually showed up on my phone. And I took a screenshot and sent it straight to West Track with no talking and the words will get onto it. And come Monday morning, machine was fixed. It was actually injectors in a grader. And the second time it happens in a roller a fuel, fuel line maintenance issue showed up on my phone. 
screenshot straight through Friday afternoon. And it was quite amazing, whereas before that would have been a long time job being held up. But to basically have a machine fixed up and no words being said, mm -hmm. and yep, got it. it, it's pretty amazing. And that the code that was on my phone was on, on their system already. So it's quite amazing now to show that, again, I'm not rescheduling jobs, I'm not, it's labour that eventually does cost you a lot more, but to have labour not affected at all in that, in that whole system of process, mm -hmm. that's quite remarkable. So maybe Chelsea, for you, um, as we look at connectivity and, you know, really I think we're just at the start of a journey, it's uh, by, by no means are we mature in this space, mm. but maybe give us uh, the view of where you see uh, this, this going, in, you know, in the next year or two. Yeah, it's so good to hear that story and I think they're the stories that we're starting to hear more and more from our customers. Uh, we now have over 6,000 machines connected and that's increased over 30% over the last two years and essentially what Westrack brings is the ability to bring all of that data together um, one to provide those alerts to the customers you know in in real time so that they can get hopefully Westrack yeah. onto it um, but you know however they they're running that um, but it also uh, allows our condition monitoring analysts to to look at that information and pick up trends and we talked about ben benchmarking pre this to better understand now proactively how can we actually improve the health health of the machines how can we make sure that they were there for our customers the remote diagnostic piece uh, we're looking at how we can incorporate those more into customers agreements too and we, without that data piece we just wouldn't be able to do that how can we actually guarantee for our customers that before we do anything um, we actually look at what they need and so that then incorporated in that service is is making sure that it all gets done at the same time rather than you know we're out in the middle of nowhere and we don't have the parts or we don't have the right person even um, to get that job done. You mentioned benchmarking there Chelsea mm. and uh, I know um, I know one benefit for Dane is understanding his idle time versus the industry or more globally mm. maybe explain how that how that works and the information that we provide to help him make decisions in their business. Yeah so that that's a direction that um, Caterpillar is actually incredibly passionate about and a part that they see that they can play because obviously you know they've got this huge machine population and and we have different customers that have different machines different sites very yeah. different things but they're going okay well we should be able to find somewhere else another site in the world and how can we actually bring that data together in a way uh, that is searchable and comparable and we can say okay in this situation this is a this is a reasonable benchmark and, that, and the idle time is one that you know is 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 standard in um, in visually in yep. um, you know pretty much any of the solutions that we provide that our customers can and can look at that and the number that have kind of seen it and it has actually really driven change in the business particularly I think in the construction space is one of those value stories that you actually get to tell that there is a real um, dollars in that and the customers can kind of take that back and go okay well this this is worth this much to us uh, at relative to the, to the you know very minor cost of technology and um, what else can we do and how do we build build from yeah. there and we can see that happen at like I know you do get the data through versus the world it's quite interesting at times you look at it and mm -hmm. I'm even noticing trends now that when I a certain jobs I already kind of know what the idle times will be mm -hmm. I can tell you for like a, a normal small construction job in town it'll be around 25 percent why because it's more interaction with people, it stop start, project managers, people like to just manage jobs with a smaller for some reason. There's always more people managing smaller jobs, whereas compared to a larger job, it's between five to ten percent if you're talking long, long days in the middle of nowhere. So the data trends are there. I haven't pushed on them yet, but I'm noticing already from that data alone going, okay, mm. yeah. I can now tell. But I think and be. being able to look at it you know, I guess globally and a different yeah. things down to the most granular level of, of the job, the site, the actual machine, the operator, uh, and, and slice and dice that data in a way that's really visible, um, allow, allows our customers to kind of act on that a lot more easily than they might have I think, yeah, past. and it does too, like we're, we're all competitive. I think you see a figure, you love to beat it. So I, I'm mm. really looking forward to actually what it, what it can help for us and drive for it, because those little 1% savings make a big difference in the long run. So Alistair, uh, you know, conversation here is a lot about, uh, you know, the buzzword of technology and we've heard some, mm. so heard some examples here of benefit. Um, do you see this as just a buzzword or w what do you see the step changes or the reason why people are driving for autonomy as you opened with and, mm. and the use of technology? Is there, 
what's the business drivers is in your view? So I think what we've been seeing it was it was uh, particularly in the mining industry. It started with safety was a key part. So I guess trying to remove people from the line of fire from a risky environment uh, was absolutely part of it. Uh, definitely the push for productivity. I think you get to a point where we've sort of reached, um, you know, where we're starting to fight over the last few little bits, and technology has enabled step change performance uh, from a productivity perspective, and, and that translates through to ultimately cost and and I guess improved business performance. I think those drivers will continue going forward, but what we're now seeing as well on top of that is is certainly the zero emission um, that's, that's now very much um, a key part of certainly our industry here in Western Australia. I think it's global, but I think Western Australia is, is taking a lead, um, a lot driven by resource sectors, but in WA it's very hard to really separate the resource sector and the construction sector because they, they obviously work close together. So I think from a technology perspective, the drivers we're going to see is, is there'll always be a continued push for, for safety and productivity. Um, I think the safety piece in the construction space is, is safety in its broader sense. There's obviously physical safety, but I think even wellbeing, job satisfaction, there's a lot of things like that um, that start to come into that. And then if we can do that in an environmentally sustainable way, um, and technology will enable that, uh, I think they are going to be the key drivers that we'll see, certainly in, in the sort of short to medium term. Mm. So maybe rephrasing that, what you're saying is the use of these applications enable us to be at the lowest cost as well as provide employment that is meaningful and beneficial going into the future? I think so, and I think it provides employment that's changing uh, in terms of it's, it's aligned with the technology and the landscape in which we live. So, you know, the next generation that's coming through and our children, um, they're natively very comfortable with, with modern technology and they're looking for work and roles that utilises that and works like that. So part of the adaptation is actually providing an environment that they want to work in and that they're familiar with. So I think there's an aspect of that as well. Dane, uh, I know that uh, following from that conversation, you've been a real early adopter across your business, especially of, of machine um, high precision technologies yeah so uh, if you look across your earth moving business you know pretty much every every piece of plant is is having a high precision piece of technology added and you know it's exciting seeing how you're taking that business but maybe maybe give us uh, your view of why you've been such an early adopter and and what do you see as a, as the step change of of what are the drivers that are making you head down that path it's it's quite interesting the last part you said was the an environment for people to work in because 10 years ago like when we first adopted technology it literally was to get efficient mm. how do we do it the most efficient way and we were growing and we were just we were the young ones on the ground doing everything ourselves and as we grew we realized that we just couldn't do everything technology gave us this chance to grow we had a massive change in business model within our company and we needed the technology to, to help us move forward now you go 10 years plus every young young generation is how green are you within your company? And green is such an important factor for every new young engineer coming through, every kid in construction, it's green, green, green. Mm. So back in the day it was efficiency and yes, we dobbed it on the machines and every single one of the machines now has technology and it's been a brilliant change, but then it led to this fact of being green. So green, well, I'll be honest with you, was never the outcome at the very start, mm. but it certainly is. And through adoption technology mm. from 10, 11, 12 years ago, and I know we were ahead of the curve back then, and I know that we still are. Sometimes you push through boundaries that you like, oh, I made a mistake there, I probably shouldn't have gone down that path, and it has cost, cost you, but overall in terms of attracting people, a great place to work, work satisfaction, yep. safety, and now greenery, because we are doing jobs a lot more efficient, a lot cheaper, mm. at the same time, they're burning a hell of a lot less diesel. And uh, I think it's also now social responsibility yeah. to do that. We are a growing company, and I think socially, if you have the ability to make a change and for the good in the world, I think you have to now. And it's, it's embedded within now that we do that for the right reasons. I think that's a great conversation. Um, if we look at our business as Westrack, our social conscience yep. is something that we are very conscious of and really our license to operate and how do we, uh, you know, how do we make what we leave behind for, for the next generation, the generation after better than it was before. So a lot of conversation about um, carbon zero to start with, uh, you know, social license to operate, uh, being seen as green as operations. I think what's really exciting from a Caterpillar perspective is the real drive from engineering to try and combine all of those together. 
and we're seeing that now with the with the design of both machines and services so really focused on the machine being as efficient as possible and then a technology layer overlaying that that enables you to be consistent and reliable in, in, in moving that, it's rather than con a consideration of how clean the, the fumes are coming out, it's a real focus on the total job site and, and quantity of fuel burn. You know, carbon zero is, is, sounds like a real lofty goal and sounds like a, a wild future. Where, um, where do you see that, Dane, maybe starting with you from your business and what are the things that you're, you're already doing on that journey today and where, where you could see it heading? I would love to be carbon zero. Oh, I still think maybe um, I think in the mining sector, I think the mining sector will get there before the construction sector. I think there's probably a lot bigger money in terms of that and what's being invested. Like I do know of some, you know, you heard recently, some people buying some zero carbon trains and some new big trucks come out, which is quite amazing. For the construction sector, I think, still think we're probably 10, 15 years away of that technology pushing through into the smaller customer. Where I see it going, look, eventually, yeah, it will be, I think it'll be another fuel source. I don't think it'll be electric, all electric. I think it'll be probably something like hydrogen, to be honest. It's got to be another fuel source. We're just too remote to be able to plug into a power station along the way. Um, where it goes though, look, it's going to be, it's going to be driven by, look, the shareholder and it's going to be driven on, on what demands of the market are. I can't say exactly where it's going to go. So I'm a bit stumped on that one. <laughs> so. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe Alistair just, I mean, I think the exciting bit is what we're already doing today. And Dane, you probably answered it in your prior mm. questions is you've been a very early adopter of, mm. of seeing the journey. And, and I think it's a, you know, it's a journey. It's not a, it's not you open one door and, and you're immediately yeah. there. It's about how do we be more efficient each day mm. and how do we tie engineering to that? And maybe Chelsea, there's so much. We go back to the use of data and mm. solutions and everything else. How, how do you see that supporting that same journey? Yeah, so I mean, in the space that I am in, um, I guess it is about that. How do we be more efficient day in, day out? So, you know, as, as we talked about, a lot of the data can be used and we are using to help our customers improve the productivity. So, you know, if, if they can move dirt at, you know, 5% less than they were previously, that's 5% less, less carbon, right? Just using the current day-to-day -day technology. And then I think from a maintenance perspective, there's a lot in it as well in, you know, again, the remote piece, like we've got a lot of, you know, movement around moving machines, um, rework, duplication, because we don't have a clear view of what's going on. So it's kind of, we have to go to the machine, see what's happening. The technology that we have now is removing the need for a lot of that rework so that we actually can come prepared. Um, we can actually go, okay, this is what we need and we can go and get the job done quickly with one trip. You are right. It's, like, it's, it's not just about the actual job. It's about the workshop. It's about mm. uploading designs and files before you even get to the job. Mm -hmm. It's sitting with the engineers and sitting with the architects. And there are some jobs we've just completed now that I drive by. And with our skill set machinery, I look at that job and go, there's no way in the world a human eye could now do that job mm. because it's all based off machinery and technology. And you're like, so imagine then coming back that two, three times. And as mm. you said, we've got to rework it, we've got to remeasure it. Yes. But if you've got the machine there, it's already connected mm. to the office. You send the file up design. And as the machine's going along, you're in real time seeing exactly what the machine's doing. You're, you're right, you're not re-burning, you're not redoing the mm. work. Mm. You're not sitting down idling, you're not dealing with the architect or engineer on site. Yeah. And those little factors, I know it might seem small, but that adds up. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And it I adds up. Like even that, the maintenance and the asset health piece where you can pick things up before they fail, right? And so that you can actually yep. you know, fix the smaller component rather than having to get a whole brand new component and obviously all the the carbon and, think, and issues associated with that. One of the other things that I think Chelsea's area will help with is um, the more data we're able to get, the better we can start to understand, like if we just talk carbon, we can understand where it's coming from yeah. and what's driving it and how we're saving it. So even to your point of, if I don't now have to send a mechanic out to actually understand the problem because I know, then there's a, a number of kilometres and in, in the Pilbara in Western Australia, we're, we're talking hundreds, sometimes thousands of kilometres of, of saved travel. That has a, a direct carbon mm -hmm. um, impact and I think in Chelsea's area being able to measure that correlate that and then over time have those data sources where we can match that up mm. 
to your point, number one, it's an immediate saving. Yep. But over time, I think it will inform us as to how to do that even better again. So I, I, I think it's a, you know, it's it's that first step. We've got to take those steps because we don't quite know where it'll end up. So I don't think, to your point, Dane, we can necessarily say what it's going to look like in five years. No. But I think there's steps that we know we're going to take, and as we take those, we'll progressively get smarter and, and better at doing it. I say, so if you had known what you had to go through at the start of the journey, you would never have done it. Mm -hmm. But now you're up to this point. <laughs> It's pretty cool, and it's ma now it's maybe it's not about maintenance schedule now. It's about preventative maintenance. I know you guys have your SIS program now, so every time we have an issue with a machine, they go back into their system, which is worldwide again with West Track, and go, oh, we've seen this problem over in North America with our machine. We go, let's go look at this point, mm. or we know this is going to happen with a machine at 5,000 hours. So we better replace this part. Mm. And those little things are huge. And mm. I said, when you're in the middle of nowhere with 10 people and it stops. Oh. Dane, maybe for the audience, uh, we've talked a lot about guidance technology, 3D technology, yep. etc. Maybe give everyone a view of how you're utilising those technologies. What, what do you do with a 3D system on a, on a grader or a dozer? Oh, or, well, or what, what does it actually do this, for you? I mean, we don't, they're not as big as these ones, these. <laughs> but um, it's literally the 3D system. Every job we do now is, is surveyed and touched. So we do not touch a job now without being at pre-surveyed before we begin. So we get the cuts and fields, we get the amount of cubes, amount of material we need, and then from there we can base on actually how the job goes. Um, it took a while to get the contractors and our operators to understand it, but now it's funny, no one wants to touch a job now without technology. And it's funny, they're like, where's our screen? Where's our data? Yeah. And um, in the days of rushing and trying to get things through it, and it's that rush, rush, rush mentality, it's like, no, back off, get the data right, do it safely. Yeah. Let's understand the job first and then let's let's begin. And now what we're doing, we are we are building roads and we are knowing exactly to the like ten or twenty tonne exactly what we're we're using with, you know, we can preempt exactly how many cues we're gonna do per day. We know exactly where to put the material on the job to make it more efficient, you know. Um, all these little factors. It's it's quite exciting what 3D's taken us. And I don't have it just on a grader now, like Everything rolls around that machine and that was so important to have 3D technology on that machine because he controls the water truck driver, the loader driver, the engineer, the architect, the soil tester, like everything revolves around the grader. But now how do we take that next degree and go, right, I want to hit my excavator, I want to hit my loader, I want my roller so he's not doing more than 10, eight, five, six passes now. Like I want it in my dozers and then all those machines are connected up now and they're all starting to talk to each other. And that's the next connectivity. We're just about to do that next stage, which is pretty cool, Chess, where we start to have all the machines talking and then they're talking to our main office mm. now. And I'm, we're just on the brink of doing it. So in five years time, I don't know where this is gonna take us, but five years ago, I wouldn't have said, this is where we're gonna be right now. Yep. Seeing all these benefits rolling through what you're describing, is it less rework? Is it, is, oh. it a, is it a better bottom line or a more consistent bottom line to what you've quoted? Is it more reliable? It's definitely more reliable. It gives you a more consistent product. You don't get the, unfortunately as humans, we have that emotional yeah. factor involved, I'll be honest. Um, so you, your levels are basically spot on every day. Monday through to Saturday, or Monday through to Sunday, or 24 seven, yeah. a computer will stay consistent. Unless sometimes you might get an automatic train come through and knock at a few, <laughs> few systems with a few different radio frequencies, but okay. it is a lot more consistent. Very little rework, the only rework does, problem now is in the designs or understanding designs now and it's funny now we're actually helping people who are designing jobs how to design a little bit better and that's also trying to marry the two together how do we marry the design with the machine design and how we get it right so um, and I think to that point we've seen this is the success of technology in mining we talk about people process and technology the technology enables it you actually have to change the people and process to, to extract the value from the technology and, and i suspect in your space one of the things i think could happen is designers will start to better understand what the machine's capable of and therefore i mean their design so in an autonomous mind we've seen the mind design change yeah. to get the most value out of autonomy and i can imagine in your space you'll start to see the same if we know that we can get a guaranteed compaction from six rolls of my roller yes. if i set everything up prior correctly start. i can start to get every machine to do its bit yeah. to enable that roller so it's actually a sum of parts and, and i think that to me will be part of what we'll see coming forward is that people will work out how to break the process down and then optimise parts of that process that will enable your vision of, of all the machines working together very efficiently. And then I suppose as me, as if I'm doing a job for someone, I want to do whatever I can to benefit my customer. So the longer relationship that we can have understanding these two together, the more success as we will share together. And that's our ultimate aim, you know, the longer the relationship, the better success we'll share. And if they can understand how to design better and we can understand how to 
get it on the ground faster, well then that's going to benefit everyone in the, in the longer term. So these are ultimate aims that we try and aim for. Um, it's just, it's small steps, Cameron. It is literally, <laughs> it's, it's little things and then it'll be, the, how do you make the workshop better to get the machines out mm. faster with Chelsea and how do you connect it and understand that data coming mm. through. Mm. Um, I know it sounds silly, but connectivity and making phone calls where a machine is now, mm. like we don't lose machines anymore. Mm. Like we used to lose machines. Mm. I know it's a big machine, but mm. machines do go missing. So even those little, you know, yeah. phone call. But I think the phone, those small steps, like to Alice's point about the people process and technology like the technology has been around but trying to connect those three together you almost need to be taking those little steps and having you know the people learn what's possible yeah. um, and the processes adjust over time to really actually take advantage of what the technology can do yeah and it, it will get there it is and it's funny like yeah people say where would you start and my my advice is start when you're small mm. um get the get the technology in early um we were kind of medium-sized i'd hate to see someone big try and do it mm. but um, I, I welcome everyone to do it because it does have a benefit. But I think you can start small. One of my teams, the connectivity team, they're doing a really good job of working with customers regardless of their size oh. of saying okay do you have to start small there's no point us trying to sell you this ultimate solution up here you know though, though we may try we really do see <laughs> the most success in uh, you know let's just let's just get you connected let's just get you you know all your machines visible and visually see your health alerts and see all the samples and then we can kind of take you up the process slowly but surely as those other two pieces of the, the people and process come into your business. It's funny like I went to 2012 Expo in, in um, Vegas and the difference between then to now my change in attitude as to you know want to look at machinery as to now like it's funny it's only been you know seven eight years or nine years and in that short amount of time the change mm. One, one of the other things I want to go back to, you talked about all the different products that you have that are utilising it, and you talked about your operators uh, or your people being, uh, I guess, greener now. Yeah. Have you seen the next generation visualisations also help? So, you know, the display that you have in your new excavators and your new dozer, does that make a difference on the job site? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the one thing now is where guys can have GPS tracking off a satellite and a UTS data station with a new machine as he's driving along and you can flick in between the, the two as well. And we've just also got the new 150M Masters, which has been absolutely brilliant as well. So no more domes going through windows, which does happen, but <laughs> that kind of technology, it's been phenomenal what they're learning. And then the 336s now, those excavators now, we can, you know, especially on, the, on some of the, the rail, rail lines, we can stop where they actually got to swing to, but also where they're actually swinging to, the data you can get on that screen now is that it says the actual reach of the machine and the actual design itself as well. That new level of earthworks, again, it was complicated and it was, a, it was another whole new level that, again, I'm still learning. But what it's enabled now is connectivity between us and Perth. Mm. So if I've got an issue now, I don't need to send someone to site. I just need to make a phone call now and they get access to my, have the machine. Mm -hmm via a computer in Perth and can see what's actually happening on the machine as well. So it's not only helped me on site, backup service, mm. to keep the machine moving as well has been a great, great I, I want to just flesh out a little bit more what you just talked about there, the safety elements, because yes. we haven't talked a lot about that as yet, but I think that's a really important point. And Alistair, if you can step into on, mm. on what it's changed in mining, but Dane, with you first, you just mentioned that the machine has capability, I guess, to not operate in certain corridors. So yeah. um, are, are you seeing that deliver a big benefit for you from a safety aspect of how you operate on your jobs, on busy roads, on rail corridors, on those sort of things? Definitely, I think the biggest advantage has been on rail corridors. When you've got two live tracks, you're working on one track, and right next door you have a live train going through, and we know the price of everything has gone to the roof lately, so nothing stops a a nice train coming through and the ability to, to stop that excavator actually swing in, hit almost like an imaginary wall, has been fantastic. So not only can we stop the excavator swinging left or swinging right, we can also stop it going too high up on the power lines or digging too low for gas pipelines. And it's quite amazing that they do use it. I don't know exactly when they do use it every day of the week, but I know the guys have said it's brilliant because in their safety protocols now, instead of just having a danger, it's just eliminated the problem. Because how do you eliminate it? That's the best, as you know, it's the best safety way is to eliminate the danger. So basically to stop machine moving to where it, to where it wants to go is actually fantastic. So 
And for the audience, Dane is talking about e-fence capabilities that we have on the machine, so effectively being able to program by the touch of a button the machine not breaking a, a, a certain corridor. So imagine a rail coming through and yep. I put my bucket in a certain position and it isn't able to go anywhere further. It's, and so Alistair, going back to the mining game, we see a radical change in safety by the adoption of technology. Maybe if you can elaborate on that and where you see some of those technologies rolling down to construction. Sure. So the, the driver and the mine sites has largely been about removing people from the hazardous area. Uh, that's, that's driven, I guess, from a safety perspective. In doing that, if we take an autonomous truck, for example, the, the truck then needs awareness of everything around it. So whilst we can uh, we can tell the truck certain things, um, one layer of protection is for it to also have some visibility of its environment. It does that through cameras and, and LiDAR. That technology we can take and apply down into the construction space um, in terms of you know, collision avoidance or awareness of people and, and other things on the construction site. So I guess this is where Internet of Things and, and connected assets comes together. Everything that, that um, has a, a device and connectivity on it, we can start to, to place and position and understand where that's at. So in a construction space, that's other equipment, but I guess it, it then moves towards people uh, and workers. And, uh, and Caterpillar's um, you know, in, in the throes of going to market with their connected worker strategy, which is um, at the moment they have a helmet solution um, that has a number of sensors on it. And that's both obviously tells us where that person is, but it also gives us some context to, uh, to the wellbeing of that worker. We can measure vitals on the worker. We can measure if they're, they're standing or fallen, uh, if they're working at height, et cetera. So I think those technologies become very much applicable in, in the construction space as much as mining. Maybe, uh, maybe, Dwayne, um, if we look at, um, you know, Indigenous heritage is very important for us in Western Australia. You know, we understand uh, how we operate. It's a consideration wherever we're doing a construction project, whether it's on a mine site, whether it's in public land, etc. Maybe can you articulate how, how you see the technologies we have helping you manage, uh, you know, important sites etc on your job site yeah especially now based around education i mean we're, we're getting better with heritage areas and you know first nations people and i think it's it's a great thing mm. but also now we can incorporate with geofencing into our work work areas now as well and, and avoid these heritage listed areas so i think um again it's it's probably something we could have probably adopted earlier but education and, and time um didn't allow it to be but we are now in Corbin, especially in a lot of our uh, mining sites now where heritage, heritage areas are pretty important now so we are literally incorporating to our machines and a lot of jobs actually won't let us begin now without we have to have guidance GPS machines showing these heritage listed areas now so it's not just do you have it is it, it actually is a uh, if you don't have this in your machine you can't start now so it's a must now. And, it, and is that as simple as uploading a model that shows the sites and then the, the technology on the machine manages it? Yeah, it is, it is. It's pretty simple. Like in terms of design point of view, it's just basically surveying an area and just outlining. It's probably one of the simplest things to do actually on a computer wise compared to some of the designs you've got to do. But it's maybe one of the simplest, but it's probably one of the most important. It's interesting, our, our tradesman, uh, you know, working for Westrack, no longer is just a diesel mechanic. He needs to be an electrician, a diesel mechanic. He needs to understand the GPS system. He needs to understand basic surveying. Um, and while we're not there yet, but we're certainly on that direction, it's definitely a change to our apprentice program in, in terms of the skill sets that we need to bring on board. We're mindful of new people coming through and making sure they've got all those right criteria. Do you see that as a change for operators too, or do you see it a more formal process going forward? I think we do. We do need to see a bit of a change. Everyone wants to be safe, but no one wants their, their work site to be the, the safe place to train. And that's the thing now. And with margins getting tighter, money getting tighter, people want to have a safe workforce, but no one wants to allow the people the space to learn into now. So we are trying to work, I know with you guys, well, trying to get a simulator across as well to train there. I've got, um, I'm trying to work with other simulators to, to train with the computers. So it is changing. There needs to be, a, I think, a machine operator apprenticeship now to basically standardise the industry. It's getting a lot more complicated, but simplified at the same time. So yes, it's getting complicated in what the machines can do, but I now believe that it's the skill set's not calling just to drive one machine anymore, it's to drive multiple machines. And I think if we standardise that, we offer the correct training, a safe place to train, um, a safe place for young kids to come through. I think the industry could be very well healthy and alive in the future. It's just now, we now need to know where that balance is. Same with our mechanics, becoming auto sparkies, becoming electricians. Um, as an operator now, we need to just have an operator who not only drives a machine, he's very well aware of his, of his boundaries, 
but at the same time he needs to know how to operate a computer with his, with his machine itself. So I think it's a great future. It's just we now, as the industry leaders, now need to find that right balance to teach our youth coming forward. So I guess that leads into, um, we have a lovely collie facility that really supports predominantly our mining facility. Maybe, Alistair, you can give a, we've had exactly the same problem in the mining industry mm. of, of all of a sudden we've created all of this, uh, this benefit for the industry and change. And for some reason as Australians, West Australians in particular, we're leading the globe in all mm. of these things but it's getting the education to catch up. So Alistair, could you give us a view of, of what the Collie facility has done and what it is and how that's supported uh, yeah, absolutely. Our mining change? So I guess we've, we've built a facility in Collie <coughs> to enable us to train people to support the autonomous haulage fleet. Um, <coughs> that skill set simply didn't exist 10 years ago. The people, the roles um, didn't exist. So we've had to build that for ourselves and for the industry. And, and I think it's a really interesting topic when you talk about the operators because I think one of the challenges we're going to have going forward, we're going to have a digitally savvy generation coming through that's comfortable with the technology, they've got to work out how to apply it and then we've got mid-career people who understand the work that we're doing but may not understand the technology and how do we get those two to come together? Often we focus at the, the development end, the, the, the pathway coming through and we absolutely have to but we shouldn't forget we've got companies with, with lots of employees already, how do we upskill them and how do we leverage all of the knowledge they've got? Um, so from an operator perspective in the mines, for example, the haul truck operator was often the entry point to a mining operation. If you're fully autonomous, you don't have that entry point now. So how do you train the dozer operator and the digger operator and all those things where they've not got that pit awareness and just the mining 101 type experience? So I think the education space is, is really going to be quite fascinating as to how we, uh, I think we have to change our education model and how do we do that fast enough as well. The rate of change of technology is so quick that I think some of our education models and frameworks um, are going to have to change as well. It's scary, like I know on my head with, with, with our training people, like we've taught my brother, I know how, I kind of see it, how it works and it's actually with taking videos of the older generation showing me how to do different scenarios and then here's what you should do in this scenario, but again, and then the, on the paper as well, and then, then the computer, but I've just got to get it to try and all mould together. So you are right, because you do look at this going, I was lucky I grew up in machines. I was very fortunate because mm. of dad, he enabled us to do that, but not every person's going to have that. So I broke everything when I was teenage years, so I got away with it. But never, not everyone's going to be able to mm. do that and coming through on a job. And if you have an accent on a job now, as you know. It's your license to operate. Bang. There is, you know, and that could be the difference between you actually surviving and or you getting a job or not. So this we've got to be mindful of. We've got to train these kids right, but we've got to give them space to learn where they feel comfortable to learn and not have the pressure to make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. They're going to. But we've got to give them the comfortability to be able to make that mistake and not feel they're going to hurt anyone at the same time. And be part of, like, what's next? Like, what are the solutions? You know, we've kind of talked about some of the technology and not making the most of it. I think that next generation, if we train them right, will we'll provide that next emphasis to kind of how do we how do we make the most of this? Yeah, it's an exciting path. Um, again, I don't have all the answers <laughs> now. Like I said, five years ago, I wouldn't be didn't think we we're going to be here. So for the next five years, I, I do look forward. But definitely needs to be standardisation in industry. Right, you've got to enter it. Here's what it is. Like you said, for the the mining truck for us, it was the roller or the yep. water cart. They, they start low and they build the way up to the loader, to the mm. excavator, to the grader, you know, and to the dozer. So you see these guys who have done the time, it, they make it look like an art. So the trick is now with technology, how do we get to our young kids to that point quicker mm. and more efficiently, but safely, but also with the same knowledge that these, our older generation had to begin mm. with, so. So Chelsea, maybe going on that vein and we talk about remote diagnosis and the, and the logic of actually being understand, you know, dial into a machine and understand what's wrong with it. Before we actually travelled the 400 kilometres in the vast uh, Western Australia or 800, depending on where Dane's work mm -hmm. site is, how do you see that changing, you know, the next few years? I think that a lot will happen in the remote diagnosis space in the next few years. So I, I guess there's a few things. One you know, largely we have the technology to make that happen. And we saw in other places in the world um, across cat dealers where um, COVID hit harder and they actually had rules around, around some of that, um, how, you know, that innovation and how that technology was, was uh, used to um, increase the amount of remote diagnosis that was done. I also think in terms of the subject that we were just talking about and, you know, training people and that link between all of a sudden uh, there being a lot 
higher skills, a lot different skills on the machines. Remote diagnosis helps with that solution too, right? Because you can direct the problem to the right person and have them supplement whoever's there uh, and, the, and the people on the machine at a much lower cost and with the right skill set and, and get things done quicker with less duplication and obviously get the, the outcome that you want. From a West Trap perspective, it's, it's something that we are currently working on. Um, you know, outside of COVID, probably our geography gives us the best um, impetus to kind of really make the most of that because of the distances that do need to be travelled. Uh, so it's really something that I hope, you know, we talk about five years and the crystal ball that we can be sitting here and it will be a, a really big tool in our toolkit. I think it becomes basic. You're not, you're not a maintenance company, you're pre preventative maintenance now. Mm. So you're actually preventing things happening in the first place. Mm. Now it's like, yeah, you, you know it, you see the machines. Yeah. And we've got that side of it. We've got, we've got the data, we've got the information to be able to, to actually understand what's happening. Um, it's kind of that, that process, people working with our customers, put that in place to go, okay, if this, is hap if this happens, this is how we're going to actually handle it and this is how we're going to be able to actually solve this problem in a, in a way that might be different from before. Yeah. It's been a fascinating conversation and, you know, really interesting. It seems as we look for the future, it's not one you know, there's not one silver bullet that's going to get us to the vision that we all have. There's lots and lots of steps along the way. We've recently just seen Caterpillar join together their mining and construction technology and autonomy uh, teams to really guide the future in one direction. You know, we've talked a lot about data and I, I think we're still early in that space of what, what, do, we, what do we do with that data? How, how can we get insights from it? How can we continue to improve? We talked a lot about people, the people that interact and what's the job of the future look like and how can we train an operator and you know consider in my team we have a, a couple of operator demonstrators that are globally first class but I can't have them in every location at once so how do we use the technologies to actually bring that on board. If you're a new machine you pull on a lever and the operator has an option to watch a video of that particular function or our service people have that intuitive way of getting them straight to the training as well as you know potential new trades. So maybe to wrap up, if, if each of you could give us a view of how do you see uh, the next little while, what's the crystal ball, how how's things play out, how do, how do we see that affect us as a dealer, as, as a customer, as a service provider, uh, that'd be fantastic. Alison, maybe start with you. Sure. Um, we will see, or we're already seeing, a significant and rapid expansion of, of the product range where technology is, is coming out uh, ex-factory or becoming options. Um, so in the automation space, we're seeing automation flow into uh, many other product lines. We've got drills and dozing. Um, whilst it's not something um, Westrack supports, we've got autonomous trains. Uh, we've just recently had announcements on autonomous water carts with, with Rio Tinto, and that's going to continue to go in the mining space. Uh, in, the, in the construction space, if you look at a next-gen excavator, uh, arguably the electronic architecture on that supports automation if you wanted it. Um, and it's not so much that we're necessarily fully automated, but it, it has some of those functions on there. It controls dig, it controls lift, yep. we have geofencing capability. So I think we will definitely see that proliferation across more product. Um, connectivity is going to get better. So we'll get 5G, that's going to be faster again. That enables more data to be transmitted more quickly. Things like video transmission becomes easier and easier. And that's not only sending a video, but it's receiving. So a next-gen excavator has, um, you know, 3D cameras on it. In theory, that remote help could now be almost, you know, press the red button in the cab, I need help from, from Westrack. They can dial in, they can see my site now. Yeah. They can see the machine digitally in terms of what the machine's doing from a, a remote operation. function. We could help them literally remotely. So I think those technologies will continue to combine and create new opportunities for us to support and, and for the customers to, to continue to get more efficient. Mm. I think, yeah, the CVA, what he was saying with the CVA agreements that I have, I think coming from someone who had no CVA agreements probably three years ago to someone who has all the CVA agreements with, <laughs> with Westrack now. Um, I think that's been a, a great help. Um, I think you also touched on where it's going to go. That, that dialing, remote dialing, I think is a big, big one. Uh, we still have a little bit of issues remotely with, again, dropout with around, around up in the West Pilbara. Um, I think that will have to improve for that to get through. Um, it should do because of the amount of money that comes out of that one little area. So I think it should be, to me, it should have full cell service. With that then becomes, again, better connectivity. And then also our, on our aspect is training end of it. I think we have our great agreement, our great structure and our, our sort of mechanics training well. 
It's just now how do we train, I think, the operators now. I think um, getting the training down to people is going to be our next, next foreseeable future. And you did touch on whether having its video on the machine, like you come up to a certain part, how do I do this? And to, to learn to train. So um, again, I'm not too sure what it looks like, but that's where I'd like to see a massive improvement in is the training. Dame, before we go into Chelsea, do you see, you know, Caterpillar have now released uh, remote operations, so you can operate your, your excavator from your That's office right. here in certain applications or a dozer. Do you see that in your business? Do you see applications? Definitely remotely, yeah. I think, I think around people and around, I still think it's a bit of a touchy subject for everyone still. But I have actually driven one at the last fair they had. I think, um, I think it was you guys at BHP might have had one. The big D11 dozer, a D10 Joe being driven remote, I did see that. It was quite actually a lot of fun. Um, I think on a bigger scale, yes, but not so much around. I think it's just, it's area. Like I know our D5 can have it done, our 336 can have it done, our D8 can do it now. I'd love to do it and have a bit of fun. Um, it's just the location wise, but definitely at the right time. Where there's a safety need. Or where there's a safety need, need and, and, and we're, not, we're not dealing with people on the ground. That, that's where it comes into it, yeah. Chelsea? I'll continue my theme around data. I think um, two things. One, really excited about some of the latest machine learning technologies really give us a lot more flexibility and scalability in terms of providing different customers or so, you know, who have the same problem with models that will work on their site. So I think that starts to be a game changer. But this, the second point that, point that complements that is the improvement in our ability to integrate between the OEM or CAT West Track and the customer. So that's just becoming so much easier. And that, you know, personally is the biggest shift I've seen over the last couple of years. Uh, and if we see that, you know, going into the future, we can all see the same thing and then making sure whoever's best suited is, is working on the problem using that, using that data. Awesome, I think that's a great wrap up. Um, we, we think about changing the, the view of maintenance being a, you know, an issue that is always a motive to actually being a real positive because it's being predictive. We're working together with our customers. It's not, uh, it's planned, it's not unplanned. So really exciting. Thank you all for your time. I think it's been a great discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.